Hello, and thank you for joining us for this Hagley History Hangout. I'm Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library. And I am being joined today by Dr. Danya Pilgrim, Assistant Professor at Temple University. And we will be discussing her dissertation project completed recently, Gastronomic Alchemy, How Black Philadelphia Caterers Transformed Taste into Capital, 1790 to 1925, uh, for which uh, Dr. Pilgrim has received exploratory and Henry Bowen DuPont research grants from the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society. And in Dr. Pilgrim's project, Gastronomic Alchemy, Pilgrim reveals the development and efflorescence of a Philadelphia catering industry owned and operated by African-American waiters, brokers, cooks, and others. And through their work, Black caterers earned economic success and cultural influence in Philadelphia that combined to form meaningful capital which helped to create and support a vibrant Black community. By uncovering this process of capital formation, Dr. Pilgrim illuminates how one group of African-Americans fought for self-determination in every aspect of their lives. Uh, Danya, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Sure, I'm glad to be here. Uh, well, could you perhaps um, give us a thumbnail sketch of the, the story you've uncovered? Um, I noticed uh, that there's, you describe a rise and a fall of this, this industry, and could you perhaps uh, sort of give us a beginning, middle, and end of your story? Sure. So when I think about the beginnings of the African-American catering industry in Philadelphia, I'm really looking at the era of 1790 to 1800, the years when the um, capital of the country was in Philadelphia. And just kind of a rise in food culture at that time. Um, there were diplomats moving in and out of the city. Um, There's a lot of uh, building and a lot of um, just expansion during that time in terms of culture. And the caterers, and at that time they weren't known as caterers, but they were still serving the function of caterers. So mostly public waiters is what we would call them. These are gentlemen who contract their services with businesses or individuals to come in with a cadre of other waiters and serve food or prepare food. Um, and they might also sometimes be joined by public cooks. Again, the same function, a cook who would contract their services and serve uh, businesses or individuals. And so then we see this grouping of people who have banded together through the early 1800s. Um, and it happens that there's like a head waiter who then seems to collect people under him who work with him regularly. And the influence of Philadelphia caterers grew. So beyond the city, they were well known uh, for their dishes and for their grasp of etiquette. Um, and they were able to impart real distinction, not just on themselves, but also on the people that they served. Um, and then the kind of the height of the industry is somewhere in the 60s, 1860s, 70s, where we see a little bit of um, people being able to buy restaurants. And so a caterer who owned a restaurant could certainly exponentially increase their earnings and their, um, their renown. But then after that, um, after the Civil War, after the 1870s, then we start to see a kind of diminishment um, in the catering industry. And that story, that arc, is fairly well known. People, other scholars have, have talked about it. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is thinking about how that dropping off, if you will, happens from the viewpoint of the caterers. Because even though they were able to develop this amazing industry, that wasn't their goal, right? <laughs> they wanted to be able to provide for their families, be able to provide for their communities, um, and they were able to build this industry. But many of them were really interested in, again, serving their communities. Um, we have John Trower, who wanted to found the Tuskegee of the North and founded Downingtown Industrial, one of, is one of the founders of Downingtown uh, Industrial and Agricultural School. 
Um, and so I look at that and that the fact that the numbers of caterers are still fairly significant as we move into the 20th century, but their influence has diminished. And so thinking about that um, as part of the story that has been underexplored is kind of the arc of where the story goes. It's not just about the economics, um, but how uh, the participants in the industry are viewed from and view themselves. Right. Well, what sources uh, in the Hagley collections did you access to help you uncover this? Sure. So I use the PSFS, the Pennsylvania Saving Fund Society records the most. And I was so fortunate when I was doing my research very early, I found a research note from Michael Nash, who um, had been working at Hagley, about the PSFS records. He was interested in working class Philadelphians. And he noted in that article that about 15% of the PSFS depositors were African Americans, and that a number of them were caterers. And so when I first came to Hagley to look at the PSFS collection, I really thought I was going through ledgers. That, that was my plan, to go through the ledgers, uh, the bank ledgers, and look at individual accounts in the PSFS records. But while I was there and searching, I found a folder about dining receipts. And I looked in that folder, and it was full of almost 100 years of receipts that the PSFS had kept relating to dining and meals that they had held. Um, so when I say itemized receipts, it's the name of the public waiter. George Johnson is one of the earliest public waiters who worked with the PSFS. And then it lists what food, so for instance, uh, terrapin stew, we have fried oysters and stewed oysters, tongue, uh, various dishes of vegetables, and how much each of those dishes cost. Wow. And that opened up a whole new world for me in terms of the research, um, because I could continue to really use that material within the Hagley collection, but also to use that method in terms of looking for receipts with other records and other businesses. And that is how I found so much material that I didn't even know existed. Um, and so it was, it was a superb find and I was able uh, to go through those records and really start to not just use the records themselves as primary documents, but use them then to start generating other kinds of evidence, mm -hmm. to be able to put them together and think about how, um, what the PSFS managers decided should be on the menu, how that changed over time, if it did. It actually didn't change that much. <laughs> um, or how the prices of foodstuffs changed or rose. Um, and so that's been also really useful. Well, it, might there be a reason the menu didn't change much in 100 years? I think it has to do with taste and um, being of a certain social situation. If having the access to, for instance, terrapin stew and fried oysters and different wines mark you at a certain social class, then you tend to continue to use those same markers. Also because I think people just, in, they enjoy what they enjoy, right? <laughs> um, and so I think there is some of that. It does change a little bit over time. We see the introduction of different foods as they become more or less available. Um, turtle was pretty popular, but over time, the sea turtle population in the Caribbean is overfished. And that's one reason why we see the rise of terrapin stew, because it approximates the turtle dishes that were so popular, but they are much more numerous. They are uh, freshwater uh, relatives of the turtle who exist in like the mid-Atlantic, so. Well, what, uh... PSFS be representative of a customer of one of these public waiters and uh, uh, caterers? I, yes, I, I believe so. Because when I was doing the research, not only was I thinking about PSFS, I was able to find the mutual fund 
Society, um, at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and other businesses um, who were doing the same thing, right? They kept their receipts, they're using public waiters, not just to, and not just to serve food, right? But to also bring dishes, like to cook at the same time. Um, and so again, it was really useful for me to be able to find other businesses and to see how widespread the practice actually was. And, uh, and related to something you said earlier, it's not only about the food, it's about, the, it's about dining, it's about the, the experience uh, the, and the atmosphere around the food consumption. Yeah, um, again, it, I think it all is about a certain class position not just for the diners, but also for the caterers, right? While the diners may not have looked at the caterers as being of equal or maybe sometimes above their social station, the caterers understood that about themselves, right? And so their um, serving of certain dishes, their knowledge of what is proper, their knowledge about what is fashionable is really important to this equation. Hmm. And I think in that sense, um, uh, sort of gets at your theme of alchemy, uh, of also different types of capital, how, yes, it's a business that's earning a, a profit materially, but there's also uh, a social and cultural capital of being accumulated and, um, and, and spent after its own way. Yes. So in terms of thinking about their uh, connection with these groups of businessmen, right, they're able to get to know each other. I mean, some of these caterers serve for years, 10, 15 years, right, um, with the same group of board of managers. And so they were able to develop relationships there. And I mentioned before that the caterers are also very interested in serving their own community. So to be able to have the uh, financial capital to be able to help different groups of people in the African American community. Um, during the war, for instance, they helped at Camp William Penn with funds um, and also uh, with refreshment saloons. So we see a lot of um, uses that they put that money to, that they put uh, the social standing that they gained, their ability to use uh, what they know to grow their businesses and to continue to, in essence, spread the wealth. Well, how, how does that change then? Or um, uh, how do African-American caterers and uh, business owners um, view the relative loss of uh, that capital um, moving forward into the 20th century? So what we see is a closing down in terms of um, the upper echelon of diners, right? So the upper class gets smaller, the middle class gets wider, but the caterers are, you know, at a certain level. And so kind of these middle class uh, consumers where the market is growing are a little bit beneath them in, in some ways, right? Um, and the middle class has a different idea about um, what is fashionable or what they consider entertaining. We also have a widening of the catering industry. So we have this earlier period where African Americans were uh, pretty much monopolizing the industry in many ways, but now white women, immigrant um, Europeans are also coming in. Um, and we can also talk about African American women who often are dropped out of the story uh, of the catering industry, but who have been part of it throughout its existence, but who come into their own moving into the 20th century as owners of catering businesses. Clara Augustine is a perfect example of that. Um, she has her family's catering business, and then she really becomes the driving force, um, along with her brother and, her, and some of her other siblings, uh, moving into the 20th century. So there are a lot of movements happening at the same time. We also have an opening of enclaves uh, that are African-American. So we have African-American caterers serving other African-Americans. Right, or opening restaurants that are solely for African-Americans. Um, and so 
all of these movements are combining at, at the same time we see what has been described as a, a declension in the catering industry. It's not necessarily a, a decline at all, it's, it's a change. It is, right? And I think it has to do with influence. Mm. They were the arbiters of taste in the sense that if you're having a party and you don't know what to serve, what do you do? You go and talk to your caterer and say, I'm having friends over, what, what do I do? But as we get to the turn of the 20th century, there are different magazines. We have the rise of celebrity European chefs, right? The kind of um, information that people might seek in terms of what to serve and what to do and what is fashionable, that field widens, right? And the caterers always remain part of it, but they don't have the same share that perhaps they had uh, earlier. I'd like to get back to the documentary evidence. Uh, I, I find your use of the sources so fascinating. Um, uh, could you perhaps describe a, a little bit more how you go about interpreting a stack of receipts? Right, so um, it's, it's a couple of different things that I'm thinking about. Number one, just to find the names of caterers was amazing, right? Especially in the earlier period. There are a few caterers who are well known. I mentioned John Trower. We can talk about the Augustin family. Um, the patriarch was Peter Augustin, who is fairly well known. W.E.B. Du Bois popularized them in his book, The Philadelphia Negro. So people know about that's the kind of group, small group of men. But I knew that if their influence and their fame, um, was so talked about that there had to be more. But to be able to find those names at a time when they're not being called caterers, so if I open the Philadelphia City director, Directory, I don't find um, Prosser, James Prosser caterer in there. So how am I gonna find these other people? And so the receipts, number one, were an amazing way just to find actual names. Some of the receipts also had the names of the men who were serving with these public waiters. Wow. And so I was able then also to document um, the cooperative nature of the business where a, a head waiter is bringing up other waiters with him who are then able to start their own businesses, many of them, right? And then I can find their names in other documentary records. Um, so that, that was one amazing find for me. And then to think about, again, going back to what the actual dishes are and thinking about how much they cost and where they might come from and what they mean to the diners. Um, and so that, that is also something that then I'm also looking at records like literature or I'm thinking about um, actual material conditions in the kitchen. Like what are we using? Are we talking about a stew stove? Or are we talking about something that has to be prepared over the fire? As we're thinking about changing technology in the kitchen, how might that change the dishes that are able to be offered? Um, and how people think about those dishes. So all those things are, are coming out of receipts. It's just uh, a historian's uh, dream. It was a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, were you able to use the ledgers as, at all as well? So I did look at the ledgers um, and they were really interesting just to see um, not just that people were banking there, which obviously I expected to find after reading the research note, but that they also opened accounts for other people, right? So they helped other people to start saving their money. Um, to see also maybe some of the other organizations they were part of. So for instance, you know, there are um, African American churches who are opening accounts in PSFS and um, the caterers are sometimes kind of the custodians or, or part of that venture as well. Um, and so, and just to look at the amounts and the sums. Now, of course, that only tells us a partial story. I have no, I, no way of knowing whether or not they're also banking it at other banks, though the Western Savings Fund Society is part of the 
Pennsylvania Savings Fund Society. It's a separate bank that merges with PSFS. Um, and they do have also records of um, caterers in, in that, um, in their ledgers. They also have an identification book, which is really fascinating, where they start describing people. It's still a little bit of a mystery to me. I'm still trying to unravel the identification book. Um, but they're describing people. They're talking about what race they are, um, what kind of scars they have, their background, where they might have come from. And in that book, I was able to find somebody who, a woman who cooked for the Augustaire family and worked for them. And so again, it's, you know, sifting through this kind of minute detail and then finding something that I didn't expect, but that leads me to something else. Do you remember or recall a, a particular aha moment or a moment of excitement during your archival work? There, there were many. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, as I described, like finding the receipts when I wasn't expecting to find that, and a hun almost 100 years worth, that was amazing. Um, to have heard names of various caterers and then to find the documentary evidence, like James Newman is, is an example, um, and to find that he is actually serving food at the PSFS. That was really exciting for me as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what is it like to conduct research at Hagley? It's amazing. <laughs> um, I've been really fortunate. Um, I started as a master student at the University of Delaware. And so for various classes, I was able to go and use Hagley's resources. Um, and then for my dissertation project, um, I was very fortunate to be able to get several fellowships also to work at Hagley. Um, and in that beautiful reading room with the giant windows and all of the light, which made it such a pleasant place to work. And everybody is so friendly and they're such an intellectual community that Hagley fosters. And so to be away and researching, but also to be part of that family in essence, it has been really fantastic. To be able to spread out over the long tables with my giant ledgers. I mean, sometimes the ledgers were almost <laughs> as, as big as I was um, in some ways. Um, and to be able to spread those out, to work with really knowledgeable people um, has been amazing. Well, thank you so much for saying so, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. It's a pleasure to hear about your work. And uh, for the audience, if you'd like more information about the Hagley History Hangout program, about the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society, or the Hagley Museum and Library, you can check out our website at hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Uh, Danya, thank you so much. Thank you.